Hi guys and welcome to AdCoder beginner contest number 251. As you can see in contest I solved first 7 problems that is problems A through G. I couldn't solve problem X but I got some reasonable ideas and one day later today I had time to upsolve it so now I'm ready to guide you through all the problems in case you had some difficulties with them. But before we begin, I wanted to ask you, I know that a lot of people don't like geometry and problem G this time was geometry problem. I myself am not a big fan of geometry, but I do think that some geometry problems are kind of cute. For example, this problem G was neat. So I wanted to ask you, uh, let me know in the comments down below whether or not you like geometry. Let's take a look at problem A now. So problem A is kind of implementation problem. We are given a string S consisting of some lowercase English letters. And we wanted to re repeat the string until it reaches length 6. So not particularly interesting. My solution for this problem utilizes the following uh, common trick. If you ever need to compute repetition of a string, not necessarily equal to some lens, but like at least some lens, then you can add string to itself until you get at least necessary lens, and then you can trim. Entire process obviously works in linear time because length of the targeting tar resulting string will not be more than two times length of target. So yeah. In problem B, we had n weights with masses a1 through an. Integer n was called good if we were able to find at most three different weights with total mass of n. And we wanted to find count good integers up to w. So as you can see, because n is very small, we can just come up with a cubic solution in n. And that's exactly what I did. So we just, uh, first of all, we will, for each weight from one to V, we will record if it's possible or not to get this weight. Then we account for all individual weights, for all pairs, for all triples. The only tricky thing is that you cannot reuse the same weight twice. And then we count number of non-zero, of non-zero or zero elements, like depending on what you want. So that was my solution. In problem C, uh, in problem C, we had some online judge that has like submissions. For each submission, it get, gets a score. So submissions were original if it's the first time this string appears and the best is the one with the highest score. We needed to find the index of the first best uh, original submission. So once again, implementation problem, we just remind, re remember maximum score so far and maximum the end index of the best score. And we also remember all submissions that were already processed. We add submissions to process set one by one. If it was, if it's not original, then we do not consider it at all. Otherwise, if maximum gets updated, we need to update maximum and also index of maximum. And then we just print the index of maximum. Nothing particular interesting here. In problem D, Uh, similar to problem B, but this time we had like weight and we needed to find at most 300 weights such that every integer between 1 and W was representable, was like good, representable with at most three different weights. So here you can see that W is at most 10 to the 6 and naturally that kind of doesn't make sense to introduce W at all. Because you understand that if you can cover 1 to 10 to the 6, then you can cover 1 to w for every w. So obviously the problem just asks to cover one to 
1 10 to the 6 with 300 different values. And if you think about it, you will, like I immediately realized what we can do. So I was kind of lucky. This may be a very challenging problem if you don't get the right idea straight away. But my reasoning was something like one possible approach would be to try constructing greedily. That is like add one, two, three, then like, no, three is actually representable, so don't add three, then consider four, four is not representable, add four, etc. But then it kind of doesn't work. So I decided to look for something else. I kind of thought, okay, we are like, need at most three. So 300 or three sounds like 100. And then I realized like, okay, so 100 times 100 times 100, which is like, if we divide integers, our weights into three groups and combine integers only from different groups, then I'm already getting like uh, 10 to the six different elements. So I said to myself, oh, well, that's actually nice. Let me do just this. And like, then I realized that 10 to the six is 100 cubed. So I decided to represent every uh, integer in base 100, basically. So I print i, 100i, and then 10,000i. And you can see that I can like, this represents first two digits, second two digits, last two digits. There are actually, funnily enough, duplicates in my solution, like i equals to 100 here and i equals to one here are like duplicates. So you can actually do this uh, 297 weights, but that was kind of irrelevant. So yeah, <laughs> that's the entire solution. Uh, problem E was kind of easy and also like standard. We had n animals to feed. We were allowed to pay a1 yen to feed first and second, then a2 to feed second and third. So basically for every pair of consecutive animals, there is some cause that we can use to feed them. So, but this is also cyclic. So you can feed like first and last. So if you cannot feed first and last, then it's very standard dynamic programming when you just assume, okay, so I got to feed first somehow. Obviously there is only one way to do it. It's feed first and second. And then you do dynamic programming that is least cost to feed the first I animals, right? Uh, however, here you can also feed first by feeding first and last. So I account for these two cases with the following trick. Uh, this is the same as rotating our array by one. And this is actually like quite, I don't know, I've seen other problems like it, when you have to like consider three or four starting positions, you can write a dummy cycle and then rotate your array and it will automatically consider several starting positions. So yeah, then I just say like, well, I have some cost to fit first two, and then I do my DP. And that's it. I need to take minimum over all meaningful rotations. And the benefits of writing code in this way is like, if for some exam, for some reason, like your lens is not two, but 10, then you can just uh, change here instead of duplicating code 10 times. Obviously, that would not be desirable. One of the easiest problems is that I remember in recent uh, ABCs. Problem F required you to find two spanning trees uh, in such a way that first spanning tree, if we regard them as rooted at vertex one, and we consider not a tree edge, uh, then one in first tree if we consider any non-tree edge, then it needed to be from ancestor to 
predecessor, I guess. Uh, no, from ancestor to successor. Okay. Anyway, so like it needed to be a back edge, I guess. This is how it's called. And second tree, uh, none of them was allowed to be ancestor of others. So it should have been like a cross edge. If my, uh, if I remember names of three edges correctly. So this was a problem about classification of three edges. So the way I found those trees is like you, if you consider a DFS tree, you can easily see that every edge is a back edge in the sense that one of them is ancestor of another if edge is not in a tree. Because what happens is like you cannot go to not your ancestor because otherwise you should have been visited from that vertex already, but you weren't. So the only places you can go to are your ancestors. So this is just understanding DFS tree. For second one, I did BFS because I figured if we do BFS, then this difference in distances between any two vertices that are connected by edge is at most one. And it's very hard to have uh, ancestor edge, like back edge of lens one that is not a tree edge. Uh, so yeah, if you draw the distances, you will understand why it's impossible. So obviously in a back fast tree, all non-tree edges are cross edges. So yeah, it was just the problem about whether or not you understand DFS and BFS trees. It's nice though. I, I think it's one of the more educational problems in ABCs. Now let's take a look at problem G. In problem G, you are given a convex polygon with at most uh, 50 vertices. And you are given some number of translations of this polygon. So like you take all vertices, you translate them by some ver vector u i v i, and you can send, you get a new polygon. Then you intersected all of those translations. You got a new polygon, and then you got queries. For each query, we need to check if point is contained within the intersection of those polygons. Uh, so there were like a lot of translations and a lot of queries. So for this problem, it's crucial to understand uh, that convex polygon is intersection of half planes. Every half plane can be defined by two points that lie on the boundary uh, in such a way that half plane lies to the left if you go from A to B. So like each side of the polygon is essentially a half plane. For example, if we consider a side from zero to, to one, no, oh, from two zero to one two, then it's a half plane with boundary equal to this line and we go and our polygon lies to the left of it. So yeah, each of those polygons is described with n half planes. And now we get n times m half planes that we want to intersect. Uh, unfortunately, if you want to intersect half planes explicitly, it's kind of expensive, imprecise, and all kinds of problems you get. So I tried to use some library code from CP algorithms. It first of all TLE, second of all it gets wrong answer because of precision error. So the way to actually solve this problem was to notice that, well, our half planes are of a special kind. Namely, there are n classes of parallel half planes, uh, parallel in the sense that their boundaries are parallel. So for example, you can clearly say because they are all translation to, translations of the same uh, polygon, 
all of pairs of their corresponding sides are par parallel. And when you intersect two parallel half planes, uh, it's essentially one of them is contained within another, so you just take whatever is like smaller. So that's what my method inner accounts for. I have two half planes that are parallel, and I just pick the one that's within the other. I will have to check that half plane is within another. We need some way of checking that half plane contains a point. Uh, then we can just check, for example, for blue vertical line and red vertical line. Let's check if red half plane corresponding to vertical line and going to the right uh, contains a vertex, a blue vertex of a vertical half plane. Well, it doesn't. So it is not true that blue half plane lies within red because blue half plane ha has a point that is not within red. So naturally red lies within blue. And we should pick red because we pick the one that is smaller. Uh, so yeah, by checking endpoints, you can find which a half plane is within another if half planes are parallel. Because if they are not parallel, then obviously none of them is within another. Uh, so for checking that some point is within half plane, all you need to check is that angle ABP is uh, counterclockwise. That's why I said that we are going from to the half plane lies to the left from when going from A to B. This is the same condition that can be expressed uh, as cross product. Please read article on CP algorithms if you do not know how cross product works, how signed parallelogram area works, or how to check if three points form a counterclockwise angle. Once you do know, you should understand that, well, now we got ourselves of n half planes and we already know how to check that half plane contains a point. So now we just need to loop over all half planes and check that they contain, they all contain this point. If they all do, then well, it lies within the intersection, otherwise it does not. That was problem G. It was the second orange problem that I solved in contest. If you go to cancool.com, uh, you will see that problem G is low orange. This is second ever time I solved a an orange problem in contest. Here, you go. Here we will actually see that I solved it. So it was very nice, especially because it was geometry which is which I kind of don't like. Uh, first time in case you're wondering was King's Tour uh, some 20 contests ago. All right, uh, problem X. In this problem, we were given essentially an array, a compressed array of remainders modulo seven. Modulo seven. And then this array was the lowest uh, row of triangle that is formed like each value is the sum of the one to the left and with one to the right below. So we, this array generates such a triangle, right? Uh, so we were given nth row and we wanted to compute k row. Well, in this case, n was equal to six and k was equal to four. However, n was kind of huge up to 10 to the 9th, so obviously it's impossible to give us such an array explicitly. So instead what they did, they gave us run length encoding of array. Run length encoding is like so. We had uh, three twos in a row, so we they give us a pair two three, means that there are three twos. And two fives and one one. So just as last time when I seen a problem with modulo seven, this was a Lucas problem, a Lucas theorem problem, uh, which is a very nice mathematical fact about how do you compute binomial coefficients, modulo prime. 
And why binomial coefficients even play a role? Well, if you consider any element, then in any other position above it, you can see the number of ways that number of times that this element contributes to this position is equal to some binomial coefficient, which is equal to number of paths from this cell to this cell, when you are allowed to go up left and up right. So yeah, binomial coefficients model of seven and more, more generically model any prime number have a nice property that you can compute them digit by digit essentially. You take arguments of binomial coefficient digit by digit and you get Lucas theorem. If you don't know it, pause the video, go to Wikipedia page about Lucas theorem and basically read about it. There is also a nice proof. Uh, so once you know that, you kind of understand that you know how to lift up given a row, you know how to find a row that is like one above it. This is not particularly hard. You know how to find a row that is seven positions above it, etc. Uh, etc. means like 49, 330, 343, etc. So powers of seven, you can lift. And more importantly, run lengths and like, now we have two problems. First of all, given run lengths and encoding, learn how to lift it by power of seven. Uh, and then like actually find the representation modulo seven of the total number of rows that we need to lift. So the second is kind of boring. You take maximum power of seven or more generically any modulo. Uh, you divide the difference by power. It means that that many times you need to lift by power. And then you lift. And in the end, you can uh, explicitly decode your run length encoding. Powers, need, powers do not need to be considered from largest to smallest, but that's the way I did it. You can consider powers in any order. Now we need to learn how to lift run length encoding by some power of seven. Turns out, because of Lucas theorem, the lifting is as follows. If the current current number at some position pause, it will go when it goes up certain power of seven rows, it only ends up having non-zero coefficients in two positions. The one that is up, the one is, that is like all the time you go up left and the one that all the time you go up right. This is a neat fact about Lucas here. That you, like, you only get two transitions. And because you get only two transitions, you can already see that uh, there must be a compact run length encoding for the result. And uh, namely the run length encoding will this size of run lens and coin will not increase more than uh, twice. And at the same time, your row number decreases quickly. So like first operate, first lifts are cheap. And because uh, initial run lens and coin is small and last liftings are cheap because array became small already. Well, reasonably small, like five times 10 to the fifth, I believe was the constraint on K. So now half, like we know that there are two transitions, we just need to merge them. Well, transitions mean the following, like we don't want, want to apply transition to every element of the run or like to expand run length encoding and then compress it back, it doesn't make sense. So instead we apply transitions to endpoints. We know where that position will go to position minus up. This is the first time when this run length encoding, when this block will occur in the resultant run length encoding. Uh, this will stop at this point. 
That is like transition to the up and left. Transition up and right will start at position and add at position plus uh, however was however long was the length of the block. And then we keep track of position. So this is like this map contains changes of sum given position. So it, key is position and then you get change. Then you obviously need to compute like prefix sums of the map to get instead of changes to get actual values or prefix sums. Uh, once you are done, some of these uh, combined positions are kind of irrelevant because they go outside of the triangle. So we need to trim them on the left, like the one with negative position, the one is with too high to big position we need to trim from the right. And just a technical detail, like in my implementation, because I was adding like actual position to get back to run length encoding, I need to take difference of consecutive positions to obtain actual length of the block. And yeah, just like this, I get myself a combined run length encoding, like lifted version. And then I can just repeatedly lift. This is kind of slow because I'm doing this with map. You can do it without extra log because like obviously this just, we just merge two sorted sequences, right? You can merge them in linear time because they are already sorted. But I just found it easier to implement it using map. So yeah, that was my solution. Thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you soon with another contest. Bye bye guys.